always looking for people living their dream and living like it really matters. And I love finding people with a strong connection to land and to their community. But is this possible in a small suburban sized block? Well, I've travelled all the way to central Victoria to Dalesford to find out. Today I'm going to introduce you to the amazing Meg and Patrick. We don't shop at supermarkets. We swap produce for other producers in the town. We live without cars. We spend under $100 on fossil fuel energies a year. We only use wood for our heating and our cooking. Meet Meg Ullman and Patrick Jones. They're living proof that you can make a meaningful life on a small block if you put your energy, your money and your time where your values and your dreams lie. It's a quarter acre permaculture plot. We've been here 11 years and when we first moved here it was a newly subdivided block and we had two established trees, an oak tree and a willow tree. So we call it community sufficiency, not self-sufficiency. So there's lots of trading. We have about 80 different families that we uh, exchange and barter and goods, some formally, some informally. And we also are part of two different food co-ops so as much as we can, we grow what we can. So this is the nature strip food forest part of the garden that then uh, merges down into more uh, food forestry and perennial veggies. Meg calls this the birth canal yeah, of the like garden. Yeah, it's entering a different world. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And now there's a, a mix of annuals and perennials using the, the north light. A big old acorn, which is our summer air conditioner, and it also feeds uh, us. We make beer, an acorn beer, and we also make acorn flour from this tree. And now we're starting to come into the annual uh, garden, and all of the paths are on swale uh, to capture winter rain. And so this is our crop rotation area. The tiny houses are where we have volunteers come and stay and learn about permaculture. We've got the cellar in here. That's our central bank. Yeah, this is golden here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won't run out of anything. Ah, oh, this is a Fuji. Have an apple. Yeah, I want an yeah. apple. Yeah. Mmm. Mmm. Amazing. That's my first apple of the season. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Looking at your garden, it's amazing to see everything like connect so seamlessly. It's very much one system working together as yeah. opposed to lots of little things plonked all over the place. Yeah. Well, the design has been over many years and making mistakes and really thinking about where the sun is at various times of the year, where the water movements are, and really those things have designed the garden. It's a home economy. Both of us are mostly here during the week. Meg works two days a week. You're the bread winner. I'm the bread maker. What's a normal day consist of? When we want to have a cup of tea in the morning before anything gets started, uh, we have to light the wood fire, whether it's inside or the outside one in the summer months. My typical day is, on average, an hour towards fuel retrieval, so wood gathering from the local tip, bringing it back on bike trailers, chopping it up and stacking it, and about three hours towards food production. And Meg, you're more involved in Isn't food it? preservation and yeah. fermenting. And... Yes. I can see you've got purslane here, which most people would actually see as a weed and pull it out and get rid of it. What are you doing with it? So we harvest it and we eat the small leaves here and we pickle the stems. So we eat it in salads, we cook it, and it's also the highest uh, source of um, omega-3 in any green leafy vegetable. Yeah, and it's native to all parts of the world and Indigenous Australians have been eating it for thousands of years. Isn't that interesting that often the most nutritious foods are the ones that we don't seek to cultivate. They're not the mo more traditional veggies you might see around us. They're the ones that are growing in the cracks of the footpath. So our definition of a weed is a very useful plant. 
Just near here is a, a large, uh, what we call a commons. Lots of foraging of wild apple trees. This is one of many apple trees in the Shire. Apple trees have naturalised in central Victoria. And last winter I gave it a prune. We'll also bring back our potash to return to the tree. I guess this is what we mean by being uh, in some sort of exchange with the tree. We're taking the tree's harvest before the cockatoos get it. We make cider from wild apples. We make a, a year's supply of cider about this time of year, and we steam the juice, the apple juice, out of them. It's the simplest way of extracting the juice. Cheers. 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 Lovely to have you here. Cheers. So good to be here. Yeah. That tastes amazing. The honey coming through. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I'll just have a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> What we've found is from our full-time lives earning a lot more money is that by becoming increasingly moneyless, we are only 30% reliant on the monetary economy. So our 70% of our economy is non-monetary. We're physical, we're more fit, uh, we're using our bodies, but it's, it's also a soul thing. You know, it's actually just how we feel as people. The more things we give up, the more we reclaim. Megan Patrick's approach to living like it matters and to gardening is more than just about living for themselves. They're gardening for their family and their friends and the broader community, but they're also gardening for the soil and gardening for their souls. It's pretty awesome.